welcome to another edition of the Hit the Lights podcast. I have a very special guest with me today. I have uh, Mr. Bob Nuzida. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thanks, Gary. It's uh, fantastic to talk to you. Obviously, um, I think we've missed a couple of opportunities in the past to meet up, haven't we, um, unfortunately? But um, it's uh, good to finally catch up. <laughs> I'm just thinking there'll probably be people going, ah, oh, ah, oh, not Bob, not Bob. <laughs> but, uh, Gary, listen. It is what it is. I do what I do, and it, it, it's, it's great. I mean, I have to say this. You know, there, there's a, a group of you out there doing these podcasts. I think it's fantastic. And if I if, if I was a tutor in education, especially within the electrical sector, I'd be probably using these as a tutorial at least once a month. Pick one and say to the group, guys, let's sit down and listen to these guys because. You're actually the expert in the sector today. So, yeah. you know, I think what you're doing is great. No, no, thank you very much. Hopefully uh, we can get some good content today then. <laughs> 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 um, so why don't you tell us, um, obviously I know you've been in the industry or certainly the education um, part of the industry for quite a while. Why don't you take us back to your early days and maybe give us the, maybe see a bridged version of uh, uh-huh. how you came into your career and stuff. Listen, the young boy uh, grew up in, in Deptford in South East London. I think I've told you this before in an email, but, look, I, you know, I, my life changed. Uh, in 1974, I went to live in West Berlin, and I'll be honest, there was five of us. We we grew up overnight. It, it was a fantastic experience. I, I say now that was the, probably the most interesting city in the world at that time, West Berlin. Um, I went back again in 76 and 77. I got married. When we lived, my wife came with me in 76, my would-be wife. Um, we lived there in 76, 77. One of the guys I, I worked with in 74, he actually never came back. He, he's lived in Germany. Uh, he's now in America. He does six months America, six months Germany. But he never came back to the UK. He was a, he was a gas fitter. But um, he decided to make his career there. But for me, that, that was life-changing. I, you know, I went there. It, it, I grew up very quickly. I um, I mixed with people that I would never have met over here. I was just a contracting electrician over here, apprentice, contracting sparks. Then I came back, then I carried on. I was, you know, I was a contracting spark for many years. Sorry, what, with, sorry to interrupt, but obviously that's that's quite a, an interesting point. So why did why did you go to Germany? What were you looking for in Germany that you weren't oh. getting in the UK? No, no, I was actually living in Spain, and I met some people <laughs> in the bar. That was right. really difficult. I was living in Spain, I met some guys in a bar, and uh, it's, a, it's a really weird story. A barman said to, to us, it was me and another guy, where are you from? And we said, oh, from London. He said, there's three blokes who come here every night. They've got accents just like you. He said, when they come in, I'll introduce them. Well, he did that. We, we, we all got on, we became friends. Um, one of them is my brother-in-law. So that's how I met my wife through this, this sort of, you know, this incident. But um, they were going to Berlin, and they said to me, you know, we, we became friends after a couple of weeks, and they said to me, would you like to come? And I said, yeah. But, um, and I hitchhiked. I hitchhiked from Spain to West Berlin with another guy. Uh, it doesn't seem much now, but then we had no money. We we actually hitchhiked and walked, and it, it, that was a, a sort of, you know, a journey in itself. But um but yeah, I, I always wanted to travel, Gary, I'll be honest. I always had this thing about travelling, living abroad. I mean, you know, I lived in Australia for close to, to 10 years, working mm. in the West Australian mining industry, but, but that came later. But I was just as fast, but plodding along, contracting sparks, married, three kids, uh, then went to Australia, went into the mining industry, retrained, really. Uh, I was very lucky. I met, met guys out there who helped me. Um, supported me and mentored me, some older guys, and uh, I, I worked on some, some some amazing projects in Western Australia. I worked on major projects for people like uh, Siemens, ABB, um, Rio Tinto Zinc, Hammersley Iron, Western Mining, BHP, all the big players. I worked on all various projects, iron ore, copper, gold, uh, nickel, um, what, yeah. what, what sort of installations were you doing in relation to the mining? Building, building new, new, new setups, mining construction. So deposits would be found, and, and they would they would build new mines. 
But um, oh. I actually spoke about this this morning because I said to someone, I spoke to a friend of mine, I said, when it's hot, I always think of West Australia because we would work in 40, and I have done, I've worked in 50 degree temperatures. And I mm. think, wow, uh, it, 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 it was actually life, work, the construction, mining construction in Western Australia is brutal. In, in those temperatures, it, it's brutal. Um, yeah. Is there not a siesta in the middle of the day sort of thing? Oh, no, no. And the hours, are, I mean, when I think back, you start work at six, six in the morning, you do a 12-hour shift, seven days a week. We used to do eight weeks on, one week off. Uh, so it is, it's, it's, it's hard, it's brutal. You get well paid, obviously. But um, it, it physically, it, it takes its toll. And, um, yeah, yeah, I'm glad I've done it because, you know, I, I, I saw interesting things, you meet interesting people, and it's it's a life experience. And as I say, always, I, I, I wanted to go to Australia for years, we went, and we came back. <laughs> and, and that's how things are. And what, why'd you come back? Uh, people think this is strange when we say this, but I can remember coming home on a break, and we were out, and my wife said to me that she missed Europe. Uh, you're very isolated in Perth, in Western Australia. It's, it's the most isolated city in the world. It, it's, it's lovely. It's lovely when your children are young. The, the education's very, very good. And, you know, we live five minutes from the beach. But I, I, I never, I never felt that I would, I would be there forever. And I just remember towards, uh, when we were thinking about coming back, I'd, I'd speak to older guys and they'd say things to me like, I'd love to go back, Bob, but, you know, grandchildren here and there, and we're stuck. And a guy that had mentored me said to me, it's the best thing to do. I said, why? He said, because it's, it's you've come, you you know, you've seen it, and if you're not totally convinced this is for you, go back. And I'll be honest, we came back, we we just slotted into life as it was before. I didn't have any problems. I'd not, I didn't have any problems going to Australia, and I didn't have any problems coming back. I, uh, we just carried on. We just carried on with our life. Right. So did you, uh, when you arrived back then, you went straight back in or continued electrical contracting? <laughs> Do you know what happened, Gary? It's just ridiculous. I arrived home on a Wednesday. I was at college the following Tuesday doing the, uh, the 16th edition because a guy had said to me, I phoned up a friend of mine who came home about six months before me, Bob, you've got to do the 16th. He said, you won't get a job without it. And I said, oh, and I phoned up a local college, and uh, the guy said, oh, it's, it's, it's starting on Tuesday. So I sort of arrived a few days later, I was back at college doing it. Yeah. So, and, and it was quite interesting, because I, I remember speaking to the tutor on the phone, and I said to him, no, I've been away for a little while, my terminology slightly changed. They call things differently in, in West Australia, and they don't like it if you call it by its English name. Mm. And, and he said, oh, he said, come over. And I went over and had a chat and, we, you know, just little things. And, and, yeah, that was my sort of start coming back. But I only stayed in, in contracting again for, for another, I think I was in it for probably five years before um, before leaving it and, and going into employment skills, which is which is really what I do now. So what instigated that change then from going doing the contracting into um, like the education sector? My wife had, my wife was ill. My wife had breast cancer. It was a, it, that was another life changing. I mean, she's fine. She had chemotherapy, surgery, chemo, radiotherapy, and we never talk about it. This is probably the first time I've spoken about it in, in, in months. But, um, it was like, almost like a, a, a defining moment because I can remember saying to her, I've had enough of, of electrical. I've done it for a long time. I've just had enough. And she said to me, why don't you go into training? She said, you always, on training courses, even in Australia, she said, you're always on about it. And I got a job as a, um, uh, a training officer with John Lang Training. Mm. We were based in um, Hackney. They did construction. They didn't do electrical or plumbing. They did brickwork, carpentry, and painting and decorating. That, that was my first, um, that was my first. And it was strange because, I'd, you know, I'd been on the tools for years, you know, for, I don't know, 37 years or something. Suddenly, I'm off the tools and I'm into a, you know, but it's, it's, st- it's still that link with industry, still that link with um, the trades. And I remember thinking when I started, the company was rubbish. I mean, the provider was, was, was they don't exist anymore. And I, I, can, I talked about them then, but it probably, they were probably the worst training provider 
imaginable because mm. most of their, their tutors were ex-trainees. They, they didn't pay the, the right wages, so that's what they got. Um, there was a lot of fraud going on. But for me, it was a good start because they, they left me alone. They let, let, let me get on with things. And some of the contacts I met then, and this is 15 years ago, I'm still working with today. I still do things with them, you know, different contractors. So I just got out and, and, and made my way. But I, was, I wasn't with them for long. I was with them for about 18 months, I think. Then I just moved on to, to various projects, learned more, learned more. Finished up at London 2012. On the uh, employment skill, I was an employment skills manager at London 2012. Uh, I went there in 2007. Um, delivered the apprenticeship program. We did. We did well. Um, so, what sort of things did you have to deliver as part of that program? We, <laughs> it was, we. I always say to people, I think the Olympic Delivery Authority was very lucky because the first two managers they employed. It was me and another guy, and he was a Sparks. So right. we had a totally different mindset to, to the people that followed us, to, who were really just sort of uh, admin people, you know, employment and skills, uh, community, corporate social responsibility type. We we had an agenda that we created ourselves that we would visit colleges. I think we visited every college in London uh, for the apprenticeship program. We we assessed young people. We we went out and spoke about the Olympics. We engaged with contractors. We we did skills events. We did lots and lots of, of, of interaction sessions with employers and uh, candidates at, at colleges. And we met our targets. I mean, we actually, at the end of the Olympics, we placed 80 apprentices outside of London 2012. And we were told we couldn't count them in the figures. Why, why, why was that? Because they, they didn't work on the park. He said the, the, it's only for people that actually worked on the Olympic Park or the Athletes' Village. Although we didn't do anything with the village. We just did the Olympic Park. We said that's fine because for us, these people had gone into work. I remember an employer coming and he, he, his target was to employ two apprentices. And at the end of his interview session, he said to me, how many do I have to employ? And I said, two. He said, I'll take four. He said, I'll take two for here. He said, I'll take two for London. And that happened quite a lot. Mm. Then people would phone and say, um, have you got any candidates ready to go? And I'd say, yeah. And then, and, and that's what we do. We'd feed them to companies. And for us, that was great because these, these people, and, and we would tell people, you know, if we don't place you here, we'll try extremely hard to place you somewhere else. So I, I, I think we did all right. And, you know, regardless of it, it wasn't in the stats. We, we, we were happy. We knew. Uh, we walked away knowing that we'd done a good job. So you were um, engaging with these apprentices what, from local colleges then and trying to find yeah. them placements? All college, yeah, all college. I mean, I'd go out and do assessment sessions. We'd visit. We'd go and do talks um, just to get everyone on board because the apprenticeship program at 2012 was was pan London. It wasn't just the, the, the boroughs involved, the six host boroughs. It was, it was a pan London because... Um, that's how it was designed in the in the early days. That every every young person in London would, would get a, uh, an opportunity. And that's, so for that we would have to go. I'd go and visit. I don't know, Bexley College. I'd go, go out to um, Uxbridge. I'd go to Harlow and Barking and Dagenham and all over. I'd, I'd visit all colleges. I'd mm. get in touch with them. if they did. Some colleges that weren't interested. I'll be honest. Some weren't interested, and that was fine. We'd still go. We we'd meet people and we say to them, "Do you want an assessment?" day a couple of days and some would say no we you know we're quite happy with what we're doing but um yeah but, but i'll be honest gary 2012 was quite interesting because it allowed me to see colleges from from another side and it allowed me to to, to see what, what the what the sort of obstacles were in getting young people from from colleges in, into employment so what were some of those obstacles well, because they, they, what, what we're being taught in colleges weren't, you know, they turn up, they turn up for, for work. They, they didn't have the skills and some of the employers would say, but you, you've been at college for two years or what? One of the biggest, one of the biggest problems in, with this is starting times. People might hear this and go, oh, Bob's off again on this, but I'll be honest with you, Gary, in FE colleges, we start too late. Nine o'clock, 
the construction trades is too late. Because yeah. no one in construction starts at nine o'clock. No, I worked at yeah. I, I worked at Bath and Dagenham College for nearly five years and I'd be at my desk at quarter to seven. And I wouldn't see anyone until quarter to nine. There was only three of us in the room, but I used to say to people, This is we should be doing this for young people. I think they should start up our seven. Eight o'clock at the latest, but I would like to see seven thirty. So when they make that transition from, from education into employment, they're prepared. As it mm. is now, they're rocking into colleges at nine, sometimes later, and suddenly they, they, they get on stage if they do get an opportunity on site. It's such a job. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. I, I don't think I've had a lie in for nearly 15 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, I'm going to tell you now what happens is when, when, when you are able to have a line, you can't. I mean, yeah. I always have a crack of dawn every day. I always have done. I get up at the same time. But I think to myself, um, in some respects, I'm quite thankful for for industry for doing that. I mean, that in Australia, what I said, we start at six o'clock. Sometimes we would have an hour's journey from where we were camped to the job. So on jobs, some jobs in Australia, you'd have to be up by at least quarter past four to have a shower, have your breakfast, and then get the bus. Mm. And this coming home, you'd leave the site at six o'clock, you'd get home at seven, you'd have a quick shower, tea, you'd probably be in bed by half past eight. Yeah, yeah, I'm generally am. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm in bed by bed anyway, I've done, done for years. This is one of the things I used to say to parents of, um, of, of candidate of students, of apprentices. I'd always ask them if, if, if I met the parents, what time does he go to bed or she goes to bed? Mm. Too late. I remember a woman said about one o'clock, I said too late. He's got to be in bed by 10 o'clock. Why? Well, he's got to be at Liverpool Street for half past seven. So I said, so think about it. He's going to bed at one o'clock. You've got to do this professionally. So if they're in construction in colleges, I would like to see colleges. I'm not interested in hair and, you know, health and social care and hair and beauty. They can start on whatever they do. But I think for construction, it's it should be a separate starting time. It should be 7.30, late, latest 8 o'clock. Then... You'd get the right people enrolling. You would you wouldn't get people you wouldn't get young people enrolling thinking, oh, I might want to do this. They either do or they don't. But mm. we started off on the right sort of, you know, the, the right pathway. We 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 said to him, we say to me you should say to him at enrolment, it's a seven thirty start because that's what you'll be doing. Gary, even if they progress from trades into you know, in into becoming, I don't know, uh, a designer, an engineer, whatever. They'll still start early. This is I've been saying this for years. Everyone thinks if you progress in trades, you suddenly start at nine o'clock. Mm. Well you don't you you know that. For me, I'm I'm in the office in London by seven, so I'm leaving my house at half five. And yeah. I I'm I'm in bed by eight, nine o'clock. Yeah, I remember going to even just a college doing my H N C with, you know, eighteen year olds and they still even though they were doing what was it? Nine nine p.m. to three p. Sorry, nine a.m. to three p.m. It they struggled and um it, yeah, it's always that culture shock, isn't it? When you actually start and someone says, "Meet me somewhere at half six. But it's 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 this thing about we all know it, don't we? We all know this is the the time the industry starts. And I I, I used to think I wonder why people the unions never got involved. And, and, and did this as a you know sort of collective with, with education, mm. just to get just to get young people prepared because you know I, I, I mean when I left London 2012 and, and I joined Bark and Dagenham College uh, originally the, the principal there she's now retired but you 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 probably see her on on Twitter she tweets and or Kathy Walsh mm. Kathy was an amazing woman I can remember asking me will you come and work for me and I said what will I what will I do she said to me, you'll do what you do. And if we were together for five years, and I do say to people, I think working for Kathy probably swells anyone, but working for anyone else because she's so different. She she knows everyone. She knows her staff. She she knows, she, she, you know, she, she'd walk around the college and she, she would know people. She, she would stop and talk to everyone, security guards, tutors, anyone, mm. students. That is a sign of, of good management, isn't it, really? And um, oh. I, I always remember, probably going a bit off-piste here, but I always remember um, 
uh, Alex Ferguson's uh, autobiography and that he knew everyone down to the, you know, the dinner ladies to the cleaners and he would go around every morning shaking their hand and welcoming them in and, and stuff like that. And again, he was the first one in every day. Wow. Well, it must be, well, perhaps this is, I mean, Kathy's from Scotland, but I used to think to myself, she knows everyone. She knows everyone, and she she. It wasn't just a, a trick. She she actually, you know, she, she she knew her staff, and she was. A, I, I always say to people, she was a phenomenal leader. So for me, going into education, it wasn't. It, it, I, I worked for someone that was very passionate, very passionate about education. Would um, you know? And although she wasn't a construction expert, she 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 was that type that would go away and study. So if she attended the meeting, I remember we did a series of, of um, workshops, I think it was about 2016, and we called them Industry Speaks, BDC Listens, Barkley and Dagenham College Listens. We did three, three in a year in different places in London. We, the last one was at the college, but the other two were in central London. And uh, we had a, you know, but we did, and someone said to me afterwards, Wow, she actually listens. She doesn't just, you know, and, and it was that that we we said to industry, we just tell us, you know, what can we do? Are we at fault? What should we do better? And but unfortunately, Kathy retired. No. <laughs> <laughs> I should do. Because, I mean, I, I could imagine that the job was twenty four seven. You know, running a large college, um, I don't know, six hundred, you know, staff, whatever. But um, but but that that type of thinking, you know. Let, let's ask industry. I mean, let, let's speak to them and, and, and say was it was at least a step in the right direction. But you know, I, I've never seen it before. I've ne- I haven't seen it since. Where they're reaching out, and, you know, because Gary, I say this all the time: education and industry needs to work together much closer. We've actually had industry leading on this because you guys now you're on Tideway, Gary, aren't you? That's correct. Yeah. Right. So you could probably go into most colleges in London and ask what do you know about Tideway and I'll bet the response would be hardly anything very little yeah do you know what surprisingly uh, considering Tideway have such a bit of a PR machine behind them um, and the amount of social media content that actually gets put out there like you say very little is known by the general public let alone the colleges but you're employment and skills team because I know some of them I know some of them from uh, n- nice people I mean you know they're great but I don't think they go out and do the work in colleges that we did at, at 2012 and I've said to them that's that's how you make relationships that's how you develop relationships and that's actually how you get good candidates because you yeah. don't spend time time with these young people all the trades not just ours all I, the trades I think unfortunately a lot of it is actually driven by um, KPIs so key performance uh-huh. indicators most of the time I say, no, you can't have your KPIs for it because it's me and I'm doing it personally to help. That that's shows just the attitude. Of, if you're not, if there's no um, incentives associated with it. You're right, uh, Gary. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. It, it, it's this thing about, you know, I, I said to someone recently, I, I get approached by people. I see, if I see CSR on, on, on there, you know, they're probably really nice people, but they have no value to me because... I, I really only engage with industry. I, I don't want I don't want to be messing meddlers or people dabbling. It's I, I mean with you guys at, at Tideway, the the employment and skills team. I don't think there's anyone there with a trade background from memory. I might be wrong, but I doubt it. But Christ, you've got to go out and, and you know see where where the project runs, what areas, and go and visit these colleges and start to create your own database of candidates and, and have them prepared and ready and, and do that work, do that prep work and get them, you know, so they know what the project is. If, if, they, if they are lucky enough to be called in for an interview, that they, you know, they, they'll be aware. They can talk about the project, not turn up and saying, no idea, no, I don't know, I don't know what this is. Oh, yeah, right. It, it's, it's that thing. I think a lots, lots of projects have gone this way. Because it's, um, I suppose it's easier for them. I don't know. I think we, about, I, I, I've said this for years. I think sometimes we 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 don't mean to, and, and we and we can't help it. But I think sometimes we embarrass people because when when you're meeting with contractors, you you speak 
another language. And, and you know, they suddenly, a contractor will, will feel at ease with certain people because they understand, you know, I used to say to people, listen, I was in the business for, you know, 37 odd years. So I know what this is all about. I do. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to get up and travel into London and, and, and you know, do the, the do this work. I'm not second guessing anything I speak about. I know it from, from experience. I know how hard it is. I know. I also know the rewards it can offer. You know, life skills and progression. I'm not talking about monetary. I'm just talking about other things. But is I do think sometimes employment and skills teams on these projects they they should reach out to. I'm not saying always people like me, but reach out to trade sometimes because there might be a, a guy out there that would slot into that role and do a really good job. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with that. One of one of the um things we kind of were touching on as well it probably falls into the same conversation but just the, the quality of, of training is it in your in your experience it, you know we kind of mentioned about the timekeeping and getting ready for work is there any other aspects to the to the training that you felt were not necessarily adequate for uh, progression into work do, do, do you know what i remember i just remember i did a, a, i went to i went to night school in, in, in perth um because you know in, in Perth electricians are licensed so when I went there I I, I, I did my licensing exam I was a, a mechanic which is a contractor then I did a, a fitters exam which is someone that works on controls and, and you know motors and stuff and I've got I, I've got an A class license but I went to night school before I took my exams because you know I hadn't been to college for, for years but I just I, I just remember sitting at the college and seeing the kit that was around. And I, and I said to the tutor, he was, I never forgot him, he's from Wigan. And he, he actually did an evening course on programmable logic controllers that I signed up for a year later. But remember, I said to him, the kit in here is fantastic. And he said to me, there's no point, Bob, in teaching people here about things that they're not going to experience out there. So he said, industry here in Perth gives us equipment. He said, so... They're always aware. He said, they're not going out there and saying, they've never seen it. I don't know what that is. And I thought, that's slightly different here in the UK. We, I go into colleges now, I see a lot of plastic, a lot of plastic conduit. I don't like it, but, you know, perhaps it's a sign of the times. I don't know. But, but that's why I always think industry and education has got to work together because industry can can, can offer that, that side of, of what these young people will be going into that, that perhaps the shooters can't. You know, it, 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 it's, it's showing them the bigger picture. I mean, I can remember a guy from a, a, a tip services company, Weiss Power. I did a lot with Weiss Power in uh, um, 2012. Good company. Um, the guys there, I know he, he, he's great. I remember him when he was an apprentice, actually, one of them. But I said to, he, he, he took four or four students off me a few years ago as apprentices. And he phoned me up and he said, Bob, we gave them a some steel wire armoured to terminate. He said, they nearly fainted. He said, they've never seen anything bigger than a 1.5. I went, wow. And he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to go to the, the, the workshop. He said, we'll get out all the stuff we're not going to use. He said, I'll put it on the truck. He said, they can have it. He said, so they can play with it, take the gland off, just re it. He said, some of them, they can actually re, you know, make off a new end. But he said, at least they'll get, get the feel of it. He said, and see it. And I thought, well, that was a step in the right direction, wasn't it? Because he, he'd experienced these boys looking at him. I think he asked him to terminate, or a, a, a foreman asked him to terminate a 70 mil. He said, mm. no, they nearly fainted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you probably, you've raised probably a good point there in terms of the budgets associated with college. So you know, like an easy comparison being the the PVC conduit, it's, it's probably less than a pound a length, and then you've got yeah. steel gal conduit at, Two pound fifty five to five yeah, pound yeah. for I'll three meters. Um, yeah. I mean, how do how how do you or maybe how do you think colleges can better manage their, their budgets to be able to provide it, or is it just not possible? Well, I mean, you know, the budgets come from government funding, and, and, and that's probably. I, I mean, I, I I used to think I think the Europeans do this. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Scandinavians do. Companies sponsor and work very closely with FE colleges, especially in construction. So, you know, if you've got a company, say, let's pick one out of the random, say Skanska. Hmm. Skanska would sponsor a college, and it would take it. And I mean, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure Skanska and its supply chain 
we could be feeding materials into in, into an FE college. We're not asking; it wouldn't be, you know, massive amounts. But what you've just said, you know, galvanised conduit, perhaps you know, a couple of bundles throughout the term of galvanised conduit, you know, twenty five, thirty two mil, things like that. Mm. I mean, I do I, I do some work with a brickwork manufacturer, Forterra, and uh, I met them a couple of years ago. They're fantastic. I met the um, the marketing team actually, a, a woman called Helen Newbury. Who's um, who totally gets all of this, and they they develop the um, the Forterra Construction Hub program. So what they did, they they wrote to every college in the country, and and said to colleges, we're creating the Forterra Construction Hub. We're going to select six colleges nationally. Um, would you like to bid? So you know, you, so you had the document, you they sent you the the, the bid, and you just filled it in, and you submitted a a, a panel. Selected it, not for terror. I think they've got a, an external panel to, to look at the bids, and then six colleges were, were selected. Mm. So, the college I was, um, I was only doing two days a week for them. I wrote the bid for them, they became a construction hub. I think there's one in a couple in the Midlands, Scotland, uh, Devon. I think there's one, uh, Harlow is, is another construction hub close to London. But for terror, they, they then give, I think they give. I don't know, 12,000 bricks, different materials, really, whatever you wanted, you know, it, we've never really used the, 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 the resource because it's visits to where bricks are made. It's, it's visits from now, their technical teams. Um, mm. It's that whole thing around, totally understanding how the brickwork industry functions. And I, I always thought that that was a really sort of worthwhile product. They don't get enough... Um, um, they don't get enough kudos, in, in, in my opinion, for doing it because you very rarely see it. But the, the Forterra Construction Hub, and, and plus, when, when, when we won it, then I said to Forterra, I'd like to do some competitions. I did a, a brickwork competition for qualified bricklayers. For all guys that have got their MVQ level two or level three, um, they supported that, they sponsored that, a, a, a brickwork competition just for female students. Uh, just to give them a, a sort of platform and, and promote them. So I, I, I started to think, well, if someone like Forterra can do it in brickwork, I'm pretty sure the other people that are dotted around in the other sectors, you know, Dulux and Crown, and I know, you know, Johnson, PPG Johnson's are very keen to start working with colleges. So that's probably where, you know, if you're a forward thinking college and have the right, you know, reach out to the right people in the industry. That's probably how things will go. That you'll get departments sponsored by, you know, so it be electrical, and it will have underneath sponsored by, let's say, for argument's sake, um, ESG, PLC, or Tommy Clark, you know, T Clark Electrical. I think mm. it will go that way. Otherwise, the, the the gap between what education is is delivering and the quality of candidates they're offering becomes too big, too great. Yeah, no, I mean it's a it's a fantastic idea. You, you, even thinking just about the amount of scrap that that's, that's thrown away from all from all the works that are carried out throughout the country, maybe um maybe a movement should start here, save your scrap and give it to a college. Well, I mean we did that in 2012. They had a um, they had a place, uh, and, and all the um, materials would be put there, and then they um. They would approach colleges. It wasn't us. It was another department. We used to approach colleges and say, we've got this, we've got that. I mean, Lewisham College have just done it. One of my contractors, Swift, Swift Brickwork, had uh, these fantastic engineering bricks on a, on a project left over. Mm. And uh, all the college had to do was pay for the haulage. I, th- I think it comes to something, I don't know, 300 pound. But, um, so rather than just going into, I don't know, landfill or whatever, Hardcore. They, 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 they was, I mean, I've done it before. I mean, I can remember a company phoning me up and saying, I've got 10 pallets of, of half bricks, all professionally cut. Do you want them? Yes, yeah, of course we'll have them. Because, you know, someone will use them, you know, for projects. And it's, I don't like to see things go to waste anyway, but I think with the, um, the, the waste, I think it's, it's something that perhaps each job should, should look at and think, right, what's our nearest college? And yeah. wherever they are, then, then reach out to the college and say to them, There'll always be a vehicle at a college. They'll always have some sort of minibus or a truck that they can come and pick this up. So, you know, in the early stages of the project, 
reach out and say to the college, you know, we would, and when it's when it when we've got materials, we'll just phone, come and get it, and you know, we know it's going to a good home. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, probably moving on slightly then, in terms of enjoying, I was going to say the electrical industry, but we can we can broaden that to you know your your skills sector work as well. What's been one of the most enjoyable things for you? Oh wow, wow, not really. I mean, do you know what? One of one of the, I, 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 I actually I emailed her this morning. It was a young girl who, who was a brickwork apprentice at London 2012 for a company called Gallo Star. And when you met her, you just knew this girl loved brickwork. And I said to her, we can't promise you a job. But when an opportunity comes up, we'll put you we'll put your CV forward. She took an assessment, literacy, numeracy, scored 100%. And we also we used to do literacy, numeracy, and aspirational. We would ask young people, we want to know where do you see yourself, you know, why do you want to be an apprentice? And we, I think we used to ask for a minimum of 300 words. And it would just give us an indication. We would profile these. It would give us an indication of, you know, did they know their sector? Did, were they real? Or was it just another job? But with this girl, um, it was, you know, it, it, everything you wanted. And I put forward for the job. Um, I think there was 10 of them went for the interview. And at the end of the day, I went to see the managing director. He had my office on the Olympic Park. And I said to him, so what? He said, right, I'll take, that's the guy. He said to me, I'll take two for here and two for London. I said, to him, I said what about Kerry? And he, he put his... He put his head in his hands. And I said, what? He said, oh, Bob, she's fantastic. And I said, I told you. And he said, as she was leaving, I said to her, Kerry, where do you see yourself in 10 years? She said, in your chair. He said, it took me 22 years to get here. And she said, perhaps I'm smart. <laughs> <laughs> Fair play. <laughs> well, actually, Kerry, she, she got the job. She, she was a dream. I mean, she wasn't. The perfect apprentice, and she she never had issues there, but she but she listened, and she said to me once, you know, if I do something, they say to me, Kerry, take it down, do it again. She just do it, and she she took part in Skill Build, which is you know the comp- skills competition. She did Skill Build London in 2011. She won it. Uh, CITB never put a forward for the nationals, and when I I, I questioned this, they said, oh, you know, it's it's, it's a, an oversight. I said, well, how does she go to the Nationals? And they said, well, she needs to do it again and win. She did Skill Build London 2012. She won it. She made the Nationals. She also got an opportunity to work for Skanska as a trainee quantity surveyor. Right. And now she's moved on from Skanska. She's now with Multiplex as a quantity surveyor. Right. And I think, wow, that, that really, out of all of the things I've done, you know, there's lots, but I always think of her because... Uh, female brickwork. She did have a fantastic tour at her first college. At her other college, they were great. They 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 idolised her because they could see the passion. But I think when you see that those, and I look at her career now, and I think, wow, you know, she was um she was our first brickwork apprentice. I think she was our first female apprentice. Uh, everything she she was actually voted the outstanding apprentice at London 2012 throughout the project, and. Wow. Yes, I think with well, well, that, I mean, look, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm never after a wall or anything. The only thing I ever say to people is when I left at the end of 2012, I was asked to become a patron of the Stephen Lawrence Trust in, in Deptford. So that, that for me was, was great. You know, I, I'm from Deptford as a boy. Um, I know Doreen Lawrence. Um, I did a lot of work for the Trust and they asked me to become a patron. So that, that was, that's, that was a bonus, you know, added on from, from, from 2012. No, that's it's nice to see people blossom, isn't it? And particularly when you know they've got the potential and they fulfil that potential. Ah, uh, do you know what I think to myself? I remember a, a boy once when I was on the Olympics. He, he got on the Jubilee line with me at Stratford, and he said to me, "Do you remember me?" And he was the electrical apprentice at Newham. And I said to him, "I do." I said, "I can't think. I can't get your name because I see so many." And he said, uh, "I haven't been out weekends for six weeks." So I said, no, he said, no, no, he said, leading up to the exams. He said, but I remember you told us it's a moment in time. We're not asking you to do this for the rest of your life. He said, so I haven't been out weekends. I've just studied. I said, how do you get on? He said, I'll blitz them all. That's <laughs> good. I, remember, I remember thinking, wow, this boy would do well because he said, 
um, that all the others are laughing. He said, but I thought, nope, nope, it's, it's a few weeks, that's all I've got to do. I said to him, and then it's done, it's done and dusted. You, you've, you've passed that, haven't you? You can move on. Yeah. So what's, what's one of the things you'd like to see introduced into the industry? I'd like to see more. I'd like, I'd, I'd, <laughs> Gary, I've been, I've been on this for years, but I would like to see more more people from industry going out and doing masterclasses, lectures, workshops in, 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 in colleges in there. Especially if they've got local colleges where they're based. I mean, not, not always the sparks, but the people in the design, the people in, you know, uh, the, the, the quality of those, the procurement team. Because this, this will give students, especially full-time students, a, a, a real overview uh, of, of the sector that they're going into. But, but we don't, we, we don't see enough of that. And I, I, I used to say to people, it doesn't matter that they're, they, they won't understand. At the end of the lecture, they will. And some of them might walk away and think, well, when I've, when I've, uh, I've achieved, this might be a pathway for me. We need mm. to give them the bigger picture, not just, I saw a thing the other day on Twitter about, you know, uh, about construction. And the people saying they have never worked in construction. So their knowledge is very, very limited. And I think that's one of the issues. If, if we, we need to give students, if they're coming into, you know, electrical, plumbing, brickwork, the bigger picture. We need, organizations and, and uh, manufacturers wholesalers to go in and give give talks because i mean you know I, i've quite a good uh, i do i have a good relationship with the guys at yes electrical paul halbert in, in particular paul's a really supportive guy of education and but some of these team would have started life as electricians then moved into sales but you think how valuable they'll be to to, to, to them because they actually understand the business they're mm. not just the sales people there you know they're probably I think he told me once that he had a couple of guys he said they weren't really going to make it as fantastic sparks but they enjoyed this side and and, and it's, it's it's almost like a progression isn't it, it mm. it's another career it's the same as me going from electrical in, into employment and skills yeah no, I, one of my biggest frustrations particularly probably as a, as a project manager throughout the years has been obviously I, I, I went into it project management side quite young and didn't it, it was good that I did because it gave me that awareness like we're saying of the commercial aspects program ver- various other things and constraints that you're going to have to work with to manage a project and it's always frustrating when you're trying to convey that message to the person that you're managing and they don't understand and it, there's there's the aspect of you know, maintaining quality and standards and things, but you, the business only works if it's if it's profitable and you're at least covering your costs. So if it's been priced at a day, I need you to understand that it, it's a day. It's not yeah, two yeah. days, three days. Yeah, but it's also that thing, I think it's also that thing about I see I see these things on Twitter sometimes about um I mean for, for some strange reason I, I, I know the guys at the dry lining forum. Scott Sadler, he's fantastic. I know Scott. Scott's a really good guy, and what they've done with with the uh, you know with with the dry lining forum and its members is fantastic because they're they're, they're like a they're like, they're like a foundation. They're like a union, an agency, a, a support network. I mean, guys rock posts and say, "I'm looking to buy a drill. Any any ideas?" And people say, "Well, I've just bought a Dewalt sounds so sounds so." Get it from this, so it's, it's really sort of unusual. But these all the guys on it hate electricians, all the dry liners, <laughs> hate sparks. And I do say to Scott sometimes, Scott, I worked with you guys for years back in the eighties, but we got on like a house on fire. What happened? <laughs> Too many hammers through the walls. <laughs> yeah, and then he tells me, I think myself, well, this this is actually this is a tutorial. The students <laughs> study electric on. They've got to be because it's this thing about communication. Because you, you, you need to get on with these trades. It can't be like this where you know. Um, I hear some of the horror stories what, what what each are doing to each other. But I think to myself that that's an issue as well. The communication mm. site between various trades. Gary, can I just quickly ask? You're on Tideway, so where are you based on Tideway? So I'm actually in Fulham. Oh, okay. That's, so that's 
So, but you visit all of the. So you would go to Bermondsey. Um, so yeah, so Tideway's kind of split into three sections, and I manage the west section. So I'm from okay. Fulham up to Acton and Hammersmith. Oh, that side of it. Yeah, but I do, I do liaise. Obviously, it's a tunnel wide thing, and I do go over to uh, Chambers Wharf and Bermondsey yeah, and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I'm, yeah. I'm over there as well. Okay. So can I just quick? Can, can I ask? Is Tideway all on track? Is, is there? There's no disasters looming. No cross rail disasters. Not that I'm aware of. I think we're pretty much on track. I think the problem really is that it's a, a large civils project, and the mechanical electrical is is, is minor, really, in in the yeah, scale yeah. of in the scale of cost. But it, it is the most critical part to actually functioning the tunnel. So what what tends to happen is I end up in probably a lot of the financial uh, discussions simply because well how how do you want it to work how how do we need this to happen you know what what does what's the end result got to look like and that that's where kind of we're in but in terms of the fact that it's it's already been in planning and construction for the last 10 years probably gives you a bit of an idea of where we're at i mean i i'll be honest i don't i will do a thing from now i don't i don't follow them um type way on social media i didn't know that they probably have got a twitter account i'll, I'll start to look at it but um, yeah i mean they do videos every day i'd say yeah, probably the, the linkedin is is the better feed where they um you know they interview engineers across all the sites um to update on progress they do 3d modeling and show you where we actually physically are on the map and london and and things like that there's some really good content, content for engineers yeah Ah, see that's but but then I can remember a couple of years ago having a um uh a professor from I think from Middlesex, Dr. Noha Salib. She's a she's a BIM specialist. And she mm. gave a lecture for me at Barkin and Dagenham College and we invited the built environment students and we invited built environment students from another college to attend and we also invited the electrical and plumbing. And uh this this is the last story I'll tell you. I yeah. can remember, she, she asked him, she said, oh, what are you thinking? Oh, electrical. Plumbing, yeah, yeah. Do you think this applies to you? No. And she said, you're wrong. Bang. And she, she, what we're saying earlier about, you know, education in industry, he said, oh, the tutor said, this BIM is a passing fad, so don't get too, sort of, you know, <laughs> stressed out about it. Yeah. And I went to see the guy and I said, why would you say that? But the people that attended, I'll, I'll say to her because I still, you know, uh, engage with her it was the best thing I ever saw because she, she pitched it at, at such a she asked me what's their level and I said oh these are the ages and she pitched it just right I'm pretty sure that that you know type of, of lecture you know doesn't go on t- too often but I can remember she came in she, she, she you know she's from Middlesex University she students from colleges have gone to see her in action at the uni but I think when she came into their college and you know, she met various other trades. It was, it was quite interesting. Mm, I think yeah. what we get to earlier is more things like that have to happen for me in education. More, more, you know, not just the the um, corporate social responsibility team reaching out to, to FE, but saying, what would you like? And people might say, it would be nice if one of your engineers came out and gave a lecture. You know, could we get Gary here to give a lecture about, you know, what he does about his career? Because... I can always guarantee there'll be, there'll be students in that audience that will listen and that will spark something. That will give them a little spark and think, I could do that. That could be me. Mm. Until we start doing things like that, we're never going to know, are we? No, that's right. I mean, I, I don't remember during my time in college having one one uh, speaker or anything come to the to the college. I ended up taking oh. – I, I was very fortunate to have a varied – apprenticeship in terms of the work and the sparks that I work with that really gave a crap so I wasn't allowed to get away with anything and they really made sure that everything was done well and you learned and and you were quizzed and stuff like that so it really oh, did oh, yeah. yeah yeah so I was, I was quite fortunate and it, it, it is a shame but yeah no I definitely um we'll have to get out to more colleges as long as um, I'm not getting hassled for KPIs it's fine <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's been uh, fascinating chatting to you, Bob, and um, I'm sure, do you know what, I think we're probably going to have to do a whole another hour um, 
on, on this with you because we've skimmed over like 37 years of your career to be perfectly honest so we're gonna have to come back and, and recover that but yeah. we never mentioned i just celebrated 43 years of marriage oh well there you go happy anniversary <laughs> you know, fantastic listen gary this has been a pleasure honestly but the work you guys do honestly I, that will be my message to education is to use these, all right, you know, you can't do it weekly, perhaps at the time, but at least listen to these podcasts at least monthly or say to the students, guys, you don't have to listen to them just here. Listen to them yourself, but start to encourage young people to listen to these podcasts because they'll be learning every time. Because even at my age, I listen to them and I think, wow, I didn't know that. Mm. That's interesting. Well, that's yeah. what we do. We, we, we're supposed to be on this lifelong learning. So. Well, that- that's it. That's what it, that's what it's out there for. That's what I've done for. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Listen, well done, well done. I've, I've got one last question. I ask it to everyone. You may have heard it. What's your favourite movie? Oh, oh, I'm a bit of a movie buff, Gary. So, if I was at this moment in time, it might change tomorrow. But sitting here now, at this moment in time, my favourite movie would be. It's a French movie. It's called Tell No One. Right, okay, it's, what's that about? It's a Harlan Coben book, um, who's an American um, author, but the film w- w- was made in France. It's, 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 it's a bit complex. It's about a, a woman who goes missing for, I think she goes missing for eight years, and then um, she comes back into her husband's life. He's never got over it, but she she sends him a link, and he sees her on a, on a camera, and that, that's the thing, tell no one. But tell oh, no okay. one is it's a really good film. If I was to pick a, an English-speaking film, at this moment in time, I'd probably say, uh, because of my age and whatever, The Godfather. Godfather one. Ah, that's another classic. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, on, well, on that note, um, thank you very much, Bob. It's been a pleasure. No, you're welcome. You're welcome. Gary, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. <laughs>